Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. This is KRWG Public Media. TV, radio, online. News that matters. Now, across the Mosia Valley and the borderland, the stories that shape our community. From the KRWG Broadcast Center at New Mexico State University, this is Newsmakers. Up front this week, Las Cruces recently hosted visitors from one of our sister cities, Lerdo, Mexico. As Michael Hernandez reports, the city's relationship remains strong despite political rhetoric from President Donald Trump that delayed the trip. And it's a representation of the sisterhood and the bond between the city of Las Cruces and Lerdo. For three decades and counting, Las Cruces and Ciudad Lerdo have shown their respective countries the meaning of friendship. At a recent Las Cruces City Council meeting, officials from Lerdo and its sister cities committee signed an international agreement renewing, quote, understanding, friendship, and peace between the two cities and two nations. Sister Cities International traces its roots back to 1956. During a Cold War era summit on citizen diplomacy, President Dwight Eisenhower created the People to People program. I'm emboldened to talk because the purpose of this meeting is the most worthwhile purpose there is in the world today to help build the road to peace. Eisenhower, who served in both world wars, saw it as a way to promote peace and strengthen relationships abroad through educational, cultural, and humanitarian activities. That's led to exchange opportunities such as trainings by Las Cruces police officers and firefighters, performances by Lerdo artists, and learning English and Spanish in each other's homelands. Lerdo Mayor Maria Luisa Gonzalez HM says she hopes to introduce some of the programs she learned that Las Cruces offers back home. They are going to try to copy some of the models and implement it in Lerdo. So that is what is, you know, she's taking with her. She is especially uh, excited about the senior programs, about sustainability, and it's more specifically about the solar panels. She thinks that is something that they can implement over there. Las Cruces Sister Cities Chair Hale Huber has been involved with the program for 25 years. Huber, who also started a committee in the mid-90s with Nienberg, Germany, says exchanges with other countries can benefit cities that share similar demographics. It is positive to have a sister city relationship with a city of about the same size as your city, like Las Cruces, about 100,000 people, with a similar type economy with agriculture and and with a river that flows part of the year and, uh, and other similar aspects. And they also grow a lot of pecans and they grow chili and they grow, so there's a lot of similarities. While Sister Cities is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, the political timing of the signing isn't lost on either city's delegates. Huber says the exchange was first scheduled for April. That month, President Trump threatened to shut down the border to reduce crossings by Central American migrants seeking asylum. Huber says that forced the cities to postpone the trip. The fear was if the mayor and the city council from Lerdo was in Las Cruces and President Trump closed the border, they could be stuck for an undetermined amount of time here in Las Cruces or on this side of the border. And so with this fear caused by President Trump, um, Jose and I agreed to cancel the, the exchange that was all arranged, ready to go in April. Mayor Gonzalez HM says the delegation has to respect Trump's policies on immigration, from Remain in Mexico to the recently introduced third country rule. That states if migrants seeking asylum enter a third country on their way to the U.S., they must first apply for refugee status in that country. As a delegation, they have to be respectful of any president and the policies that they are implementing, and that she's fully aware that you know it's also up to them to do programs and create jobs in their own countries to prevent migration and to make sure that the citizens who are coming, right, that they have opportunities in their own countries to grow and prosper. But they have to respect uh, what the U.S. government is doing. My expectation for this visit is... Dr. Jose Frias is Lerdo Sister City's president, but got his start on the board in Las Cruces. Frias says he's seen the sisterhood grow during his time working with different mayors and councils. But in that time, political tensions between their respective countries have also grown. I understand that many people 
It's, it's not happy uh, knowing that uh, what the president wants to do with the border, but uh, but uh, be, beside that, and in fact, this visit has shown that we, there's no walls, there's no nothing to avoid people from different countries and different cities to get together and be really friends. The visit featured speeches from both delegations, along with the presentation of a sister city's plaque and a tour downtown. Huber says the program is one way for the U.S. to boost relations with Mexico and other countries. Regardless, the enduring bond between Lerdo and Las Cruces is solid enough, he says, to withstand the actions of President Trump. I mean, it's like we look beyond Trump. We look beyond the insanity that we're dealing with now to the future without Trump where the relationships between our country, Mexico, and other countries can be normalized and, and the borders can uh, be such that it allows for um, exchange and communication and interchange between us and other countries. And if the past 30 years are any indication, Fellowship is a valuable ambassador. Arriba Las Cruces, Arriba Durango. For KRWG Public Media, I'm Michael Hernandez. Now another reminder of our strong connection to Mexico. A new charter school is coming to Las Cruces, and as Mallory Falk reports, it will offer bilingual education. There's a small peach and beige building under construction on North Valley Drive. It doesn't look like much now, but it will be transformed into a dual language charter school. Students will learn in English and Spanish, and they'll study the indigenous language Nahuatl as a way to connect with their heritage. We are more than Cinco de Mayo in Chile and enchiladas. Lucia Baronica Carmona helped found the school, called Raices del Saber, or Roots of Knowledge. She grew up in the borderlands. My parents, my grandparents are Raramuri people, indigenous from the mountains are in, in Chihuahua. But she wasn't taught to embrace her family's history and roots. If anything, she learned to reject them. Our parents were living in the border just uh, telling us, uh, be ashamed of who we are. And that led to a sense of disconnection. When you don't have the sense, that, be that belonging is sense, you don't know where to go. You're in the middle of nowhere, you're just floating there, up there, and up in the air. Carmona doesn't want other children to go through the same experience. That's why she jumped at the chance to start, as the brochure puts it, a bilingual, biliterate, culturally responsive school. The ideas are exciting, and they're very much what our current population of students really needs in order to be challenged, and in order for us to join the rest of the world uh, <laughs> in being at least bilingual, if not multilingual, like most of the world is. Emma Armendariz chairs the school's board. She's retired now, but worked as a bilingual teacher and administrator for decades. She explains the school will follow what's known as the 90-10 model. Students won't simply take one block of Spanish the way they would in art or science class. They'll learn core subjects in Spanish. Kinder and first to teach 90% of the time in Spanish, 10% in English. Then as the children advance, uh, second grade, it's 80, 20, um, 70, 30, 30 uh, up until fifth grade when it's 50, 50. The dual language model really um, emphasizes um, the two languages as vehicles for instruction. Jennifer Hahn is executive director of bilingual and migrant education for Las Cruces Public Schools. Not just to learn how to speak or to read and write, but actually using the Spanish language and the English language in order to um, impart content knowledge for our students. Hahn says this is a proven model, but it can be hard to implement. New Mexico and the country as a whole are facing a bilingual teacher shortage. That's partly because the position can be more demanding than other forms of teaching without extra pay, incentives, or support. There are additional certification requirements, and teachers sometimes have to prepare curricula in two languages. It's pretty rare that a person is equally proficient in both languages. It's pretty rare. It happens, but it's pretty rare. So we, as dual language teachers, have to make sure that, oh my gosh, I really need to be able to use the correct terminology when I'm describing 
um, the water cycle to my students. I really need to understand the, the correct academic vocabulary for describing geometric concepts to a student. So it does take a lot of, of studying, it takes a lot of preparation. The district is trying to provide some incentives for bilingual teachers, like a $1,500 stipend. It really isn't that much when, when you think about, you know, the work that goes into um, to being um, a bilingual teacher, but it's something, it's a start. And it's partnering with New Mexico State University to provide tuition reimbursement for students who want to pursue bilingual education. Han hopes the district can help elevate Spanish. There is almost a reluctance um, to put front and center the Spanish language, which is ironic because we are just steps away from the border with Mexico, and this used to be Mexico, and most of our citizens are of Mexican descent. Um, but I, I think the effects of historical trauma, of, of colonialism, of annexation of this area, has kind of marginalized the Spanish language in a way that shouldn't be. But I really do feel there's a resurgence of, of that, of the pride in the Spanish language that we as a school district can really um, enhance and perpetuate and spread. The founders of Raices del Saber also hope to elevate indigenous language and culture. They'll introduce Nahuatl as an enrichment language. Founder Lucia Veronica Carmona says Nahuatl can expand children's understanding of language as a whole. Every indigenous language de define concepts instead of objects or name things. Take the word shinachli, she says. It describes the moment a seed germinates, reaching its bursting and in-between point. No longer a seed, but not yet a plant. Just mention shinachli, you're getting to a whole world of, of, thing, of concepts, right? Carmona hopes the school instills students with a sense of pride in their culture, the pride she herself longed for as a child. For KRWG Public Media, I'm Mallory Falk. From K-12 to higher education, we visit New Mexico State University, where student work is enhancing a university museum. Aggie Vision's John Reyes reports. The University Museum at NMSU is home to multiple art exhibitions throughout the year. Rachel Cover is a grad student that wanted to share a unique perspective on some of her findings within the arthropod collection. You're looking at my non-thesis master's exhibition uh, entitled Entomomania, Insects, and Articulture. It's a really interesting process being able to work in these museums because one hand it's the anthropology museum that has art and ethnographic material and then the other one has natural history type material with um, the entomology collection. Using macro photography, Rachel was able to capture photos that mesmerize her audience. Her images reveal the detail in an insect's design through a more intimate perspective. Unless you're a researcher, you don't get to see these beautiful insects, and so that's something I wanted to bring out from the Arthropod Museum. I found so many cultural stories that were associated with insects. Rachel focused on displaying insects like the cicada, the dragonfly, and fire ants because of their relevance to our community. I really wanted to pull out some of the insects that a lot of people know or can associate um, through human history. She hopes her exhibit changes the way we look at insects around campus. With Aggie Vision, I'm John Reyes. Also from Aggie Vision this week, a competition that looks like a lot of fun and also provides some great experience in engineering. I run the Student Project Center here at New Mexico State University for the College of Engineering. The Mini Baja competition started here at NMSU over 20 years ago, mainly uh, came in as a collegiate design competition for our mechanical engineering students. What the students have to do is they have to design, manufacture, test, go, and compete a single seat off-road vehicle. We typically compete against 100 universities from around the world with three uh, different regional competitions. When you go out there and you see 
your hundred different teams that are out there, just hundred different universities, international. You got your China team there, you got your India team there, um, every, all these teams out of uh, the United States out of there. And you're in the field competing with these universities that you like hear about, you know, and then just being from New Mexico, uh, New Mexico State University and going out there and showing what you, what you can actually bring to the table and compete with these universities. What they're going to gain is those hard skills that they're not getting in a traditional classroom setting. In addition, they're also going to get the opportunity to improve their team working ability, communication, uh, critical thinking, skills like that that they don't normally get. So there's a little bunch of mini projects, I guess you could say, that come into uh, building the car. And so just simply like working on different aspects of the car, it just helps me realize like what parts of my classes actually come into play and like how I can actually apply to the real world. It's amazing being able to see and being able to say, I helped in that, I was able to do that, and, and show to future employers, hey, I know what I'm doing, hey, I'm able to do this, is, is really helpful and really exciting. One of the problems I personally had to overcome was probably the confidence. I was kind of shy at first coming to the club, you know, being one of the, the new kids, but their, their way of talking to me and then they're, they're really encouraging to ask questions and to teaching. Mini Baja is open to all NMSU students. You don't have to be engineering, you don't have to have an interest in motorsports, you don't need to know anything. Come join, it's a great group of students, we will teach you. You want to learn how to weld, we'll teach you how to weld. You want to learn how to do design work, this is the environment to be in. You just want to hang around a great group of students and have a great time, NMSU Mini Baja is a group for you. The White Sands Missile Range Museum in Missile Park was in 1994 um, by Brigadier General Richard Wharton and the White Sands Historical Foundation as a way to preserve the artifacts and history that's occurred on the installation since 1945. Uh, in Missile Park currently we have roughly 70 large artifacts out here. Um, everything from rockets and missiles, sounding rockets, we have tracking cameras and instrumentation that have been used in the tests. We have a small collection of target drones. Target drones were used out here beginning in the, the late 1940s. A uh, different type of drone than what people are used to seeing now. And uh, through the course of this year, we'll probably be bringing out another six or seven items out of storage into Missile Park. The main attraction in Missile Park, I would say, is probably the Fat Man bomb case. But the fact that people can come out and see a lot of these things that have been tested over the years that they may have only seen on TV or in the news, they can actually come out here and walk amongst these things and, and see them up close. I think people should come out and visit the park and the museum. Um, this is an important place historically, White Sands is. Two events that changed the course of history in the 20th century, the beginning of the Atomic Age and the beginning of the Space Age, both occurred here in 1945. And from that beginning came the space program, all these rockets and missiles and everything that we see today. So it's a good place to come out and kind of get an overview of that and learn that history. One of the things we're doing in Missile Park right now is conservation of these macro artifacts. Uh, the weather out here is really beats them up bad. And so right now what we're doing, we've got a, a long-term project to conserve these. Uh, strip them down, replace, repair items that, that need repaired, and then paint them and make them look fresh again. What we hope visitors learn is just how important this small place in the middle of nowhere um, actually has been to science and technology in the United States, as well as the space age, the beginning of us going into to space, this new frontier. 
the atomic age uh, changed the course of history. Uh, we got all sorts of science out of it. And you know, really what we hope to, to people take away is that there's a lot of stuff that's been tested out here. There are scientific innovations, technological innovations that have occurred here. Remarkably, very few people know about. The museum and Missile Park are located right by the Las Cruces Gate on White Sands Missile Range. If you're coming from Las Cruces, just take 70 east toward Alamogordo and get off at, at the turn off to White Sands. We welcome visitors from all over the world. For international visitors, passport holders, you're not allowed to drive in. Um, you will have to check in at the gate. If you want to drive into the installation and you're a U.S. citizen, um, you'll need to make sure you have proof of insurance, uh, current driver's license, and uh, proof of registration of the vehicle. Um, otherwise, with a, a picture ID, you can walk through the gate um, once you check in with the guards. The missile park is open dawn to dusk. During the summertime, we recommend you don't come during the heat of the day. Mornings and evenings are, are preferred. We're open every day of the week. The best part about working here is, is well, first of all, getting to be around this stuff. Uh, most of the items in missile park are completely unique. You're not going to find them anywhere else but getting to interact with the public. Uh, we do a lot of tours, a lot of open houses. Uh, we do a lot of outreach to the local schools. That's really the best part of this, this job is getting to interact with people. Finally on the program this week, bees play a critical role in maintaining our food supply, but they're on the decline. And as Michael Hernandez reports, local beekeepers are doing their part to enhance the pollinator population. You see that nice golden liquid at the bottom there? That's what we beekeepers live for. That nice, rich golden thing, that's the honey. Consider El Paso resident Vibert Skeet a busy bee with his recent hobby. A substitute teacher for Socorro Independent School District, Skeet has kept bees in his backyard for about a year. He has two hives, one marked blue and a more aggressive red hive. Skeet started learning about the hobby from books and YouTube videos. By keeping bees, he also aims to improve his and his family's health. Secondly, I was con getting concerned about uh, all the processed food that we eat as a family, and we wanted to start to go into a more natural direction. And so starting with a simple thing like sweeteners or sugars was the way to go. Before inspecting a beehive box called a super, Skeet wears white leather gloves and a netted headpiece for protection. Protect my head. Why? Because I'm already wearing a long sleeve shirt. It's light in color, so this should not irritate the bees. He lights his smoker with a mix of shredded paper and dry leaves. See, that's a good fire right there. We'll put some smoke here. The smoke tricks the bees into thinking there's a fire. They respond by gorging themselves on honey to take with them someplace else. Now the reason why they're not attacking us in full force is because most of the, the aggressive bees are out gathering food. And the ones that are here, these are the nurse bees that are taking care of the hive and the queen. Skeet uses a curved tool to remove the hive's frames. They're stuck together by a bee glue called propolis. The bees build honeycomb in an egg-shaped pattern. This nice dusty looking like white sugar thing over the honey. That's when they're finished filling it up with honey, they cap it with this nice wax. Aside from cost, Skeet says his biggest challenge as a beginner was that he didn't know anyone else keeping bees. Then he attended his first meeting with the Paseo del Norte Beekeepers Association, more than 60 members strong. And the hope is that I can use the experience and wisdom of those persons to basically help me to become a better beekeeper and to basically help to protect my environment by supporting all the work that the bees do to make sure we have a healthy and happy environment to live in. The association meets monthly, alternating between Las Cruces and El Paso. Member Carol Powey is a farmer and private tutor. Powey and her husband George have cared for bees on and off for 30 years. A decade ago, they bought a farm in Chamberino. Powey cares for seven hives but wants to expand to ten. When she checks on a hive, which varies in frequency depending on how new it is, she looks for different indicators. I want to see if any critters have gotten into the hives. I want to see if the hive looks healthy. 
I want to see if they're if the queen is laying eggs in a, in a uh, the egg shape pattern or if she's scattered around. If the eggs are scattered around, it may mean that she's starting to fail and need to be replaced. Oh, look at all the brood on this side. This is all capped larva, and there's some larva that hasn't been capped along the edges. So these bees are doing well. That's good news, as bee populations have declined significantly since the mid-2000s. That's why it's crucial to help colonies grow. As the queen lays eggs in the first super, a second box is added to help the brood expand. Then Powie adds a screen to separate the queen. See this little strip here of wood? That is a queen excluder. And that keeps the queen from getting up into where you're collecting honey, but it allows the worker bees to come up and deposit nectar and pollen. Howie used to use an extractor to process the honey she harvested once or twice a year. Now she uses flow hives to collect the honey and sells it at the farmer's market in Sunland Park. When he moved into his El Paso home, Skeet says the backyard was bare. But he learned flowers help to attract pollinators like bees and other insects. Now he tends a small garden with sunflower, rose, and lantana plants. You know, it's just like any place else. If you don't have food to eat, nobody wants to come at you. If you have a party without food, it's not a good party. So for the bees, it's the same thing. Once they have a yard where there are flowers that they can forage and basically get some food, it's wonderful for them. Skeet says he hopes to expand to four hives by next year. For Powie, keeping bees is almost magical. You see this little tiny insect and you see what it's able to do. Um, you see how they take care of each other. You see the cycle um, and how they get along with each other. Um, and at the end, you end up with something that's delicious. So it's, it's, it's just fascinating to watch. Whether novice or pro, beekeepers say raising pollinators is a sweet way to keep bees bumbling. For KRWG Public Media, I'm Michael Hernandez. That's our time for now. Join us this week on KRWG Radio. Every weekday, it's Morning Edition from 5 to 9, fresh air at 11, followed by Here and Now, noon to 2, and All Things Considered, 4 to 7. KRWG News is always online at krwg.org, and we'd love to hear from you. Email us with your story ideas and video submissions. The address is feedback at nmsu.edu. For all of us at KRWG News, I'm Fred Martino. Have a great week. We'll see you next time on Newsmaker.